What does it mean to be the most important person in the world? Is it something that you're born with and aware of for most of your life? Or is the importance thrust upon you thanks to the actions of an outside force? And on top of this all, is it something that you would even want the responsibility of being? Well, in the case of the last active member of the failed Project Freelancer, he didn't really get the choice. This, of course, being the morally manipulated, manic memory mangled marksman mercenary, Agent Washington of Red vs. Blue, who was unknowingly placed into such a position, and by the end of the series, ultimately had to carry the scars that came with being so important around with him in his head. I'm Agent Washington of Project Freelancer, and you are watching Not the Bad Guy. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to check to see if we have to update Blue Team's roster. Again. Now, this video contains spoilers for Red vs. Blue right up until Season 17. This includes most, if not all, side material, so if you want to avoid spoilers, you have been warned. Agent Washington, also known as Wash, is one of the main characters throughout the majority of the main story of Red vs. Blue, being an active figure in the plot ever since the end of the Blood Gulch Chronicles, and appearing first in his own miniseries called Recovery 1, which did end up being very important for the next few sagas to come, that being Recollection, Freelancer, and even partly Chorus. Along with this, thanks to Wash's connection to memory, he's also been directly connected to just about every major event in the universe of Red vs. Blue, whether he was fully aware of them or not. Until, eventually, he became the single most important person in the universe. Though, before we discuss that too deeply, let's first understand the meaning behind his name and his design. Now, the name Agent Washington is explained directly in the series itself. All agents in Project Freelancer were assigned a state of the United States of America, or an American-owned territory, as their codename. The Washington is clearly taken from the 42nd state, that being Washington. Though, it's also possible it comes from the Washington in Washington, D.C. Since he was the last active member of Freelancer, that meant that the project was only Washington, the director, and the counselor. So, altogether, they were Washington, D.C., which, given D.C. is the capital of the United States and the headquarters for most Secret Service agencies, this sort of plays into Washington's special agent status. Though, outside of this, another reason why Washington was selected out of all the other states is likely to play on his role as Recovery One and his nickname, Wash, as Wash's role in in Recovery 1 was to be dispatched to locations where freelancer recovery beacons were activated, and then from there, clean it up. He was washing the area of freelancer tech, recovering only the most important stuff. Though before he was Washington, he was known as David, which means beloved, and matches up well with his perceived loyalty as an agent of freelancer, along with his own innocence before the Epsilon AI implantation. And of course it's befitting of his perceived worth by a majority of the main cast by the end of the series. Now design-wise, Washington is actually rather interesting. He has a steel or black main armor color with a yellow trim to it, the main body being steel steel was done to instantly connect him to Project Freelancer, as it resembles Tex's own main armor color, though Tex's is entirely black, and seems to have been made darker just to set them apart even more. Though he was also given a yellow stripe to set him apart from Tex as well, in case they ever shared screen time. Now, part of the reason that these specific colors were chosen was to match him to the visuals of a rocket hog, which at the time of Washington's creation was found exclusively in the PC port of Halo Combat Evolved. Now, due to this exclusivity, the the rocket hog gained sort of an elusive nature to it, and that played into the secretive nature of Washington's own character right up until the end of the Freelancer saga. Though the yellow trim was also chosen specifically because of color theory, as yellow is a color often associated with caution or warning, and due to the nature of Wash's work, he is often seen as a cautious sign for what might come. Also, his main body color being associated with another character is a theme that carries over into his other major design changes, where he goes on to wear cobalt armor, which was originally worn by Church. And this is actually sort of a meta-narrative joke, as Bernie Burns mentions during the Season 6 Director's Commentary, Washington sort of replaced Church when it came to the main plot exposition. Not only being the focus that brought new viewers in to Freelancer through Recovery 1, but also acting as sort of a new leader for Blue Team, both with Church's presence and his absence. 
Though before the Reds and the Blues and before Freelancer, David was a member of the UNSC's army during the Great War. He enlisted sometime before 2537, but it's not sure when, but he completed his boot camp training within the Leonis Minoris system before it was glassed by Covenant forces. And during his time in service to the UNSC, David acquired the rank of Corporal, and one day, while working between two different systems, his platoon was ambushed by Covenant forces, and his staff sergeant wanted to essentially send his men to their deaths. Washington disagreed with this order and refused to follow it, and while he received an earful, the staff sergeant soon found himself picking his jaw off the floor. Though, due to his actions that day, David would be court-martialed by the UNSC. Though, this wouldn't be the end of David's military career, as Project Freelancer did what it does best and snatched up the UNSC's leftovers as soon as they could. Reaching out to David and going over his record with a fine-tooth comb, they found anything that they could hook him with. Eventually, they seemed to focus in on his aggression towards authority, and more specifically, bullies. Even bringing up a moment from his past where David would break his upperclassman bully's nose by smashing him face first in a mirror for saying just the wrong thing. Along with this, it would seem like the director did favor David's willingness to force things to go his way, encouraging him to join Freelancer under the guise of giving him a second chance. And while he did agree to join Freelancer because he had no real other options, David, like many others in his position, did seem to believe in the director and his vision at one point. Now, how Freelancer worked is actually rather similar to the Spartan 2 program. David had his old identity completely erased, and he was assigned a new title of Agent Washington. He was also issued a special suit of Mark VI Mjolnir armor, which must have been heavily modified in some way to allow regular people to use it, as regular Mark VI couldn't be operated by non-Spartan 2s without severely injuring the person. Though, to make up for what I assume is a downgrade in protection, each suit was equipped with an armor enhancement. In the case of Washington, Washington, his emitted a short electromagnetic pulse, or an EMP, which allowed him to temporarily disable electronic devices around him. Now, to say Washington underperformed in Freelancer is a bit of an understatement. He was considered one of the worst agents in the whole unit, even doing rookie mistakes such as throwing grenades without triggering their pins. He was bottom of the food chain alongside the rest of the washouts from the UNSC. Along with this, at this point in his life, Washington was also rather innocent. He wasn't the cold and calculating agent from Recovery 1 days. This resulted in him not only being constantly teased and tricked by his higher ranking companions. Why won't anyone listen to me? Oh, that's easy. It's because you're a loser. But he also looked out for his friends and tried to comfort them in their harder times. His innocent nature was also best represented by his locker, which is seen during the Freelancer flashbacks segments, being full of cat pictures, likely of his family cat Loki, but also a skateboard, which played into his rebellious nature to come. Though through hard work and training, Washington eventually earned his way up the ladder of Freelancer and entered into the top 10 ranked agents, always floating around the 5th or 6th place. He had become seriously lethal with a battle rifle and an expert at hand-to-hand -hand combats, as well as very adept with knives. But even at this level, Washington was still green in comparison to his companions, eventually becoming best known for the time Carolina pulled him out of the vacuum of space via grappling hook to the balls. Even still, he got results, and this qualified Washington for AI implantation, and he was eventually called up to be implanted with an AI fragment known as Epsilon, a process that would radically change Washington's life forever, as Epsilon was an AI fragment comprised of the memories of the Alpha AI that was segmented off so it couldn't remember what the director had done to it, and during the implantation, Epsilon instantly became unstable, flooding Washington's mind with not only the torture that the Alpha was subjected to, but memories of the director that led to the creation of Project Freelancer to begin with, before, eventually, Epsilon tore itself apart with inside Washington's mind. Washington was permanently changed by this event. His upbeat attitude was bittered by Epsilon's memories quickly fusing together with his own. And thanks to Washington's naturally good memory, which he used to hold long-term grudges, he was never able to forget the horrors that he saw that day, even finding it difficult to differentiate between Epsilon's suffering and his own. Along with this, it also painted a very different picture of the director, as well as the whole of the freelancer program. There was no grand goal to save humanity, 
Kennedy. This was a morally corrupt agency led by a scientist stuck chasing a shadow. Along with this, discovering the truth behind Freelancer was one of the first in many betrayals of Washington's trust throughout his character. Though following the Epsilon incident, a lot of those who followed a director turned their back on the program in some way. There was even a coup staged by some freelancers in order to recover the Alpha AI. One that ended in failure, but left Freelancer Command on high alert. And from there, even those who sided with the director eventually went their own way, leaving Washington as the last official member of Freelancer to be active. A survivor in a sense, something that would become another tragic trend within his life. Now, even though he chose to stay with Freelancer, Wash actively refused to be implanted with another AI, or work with another team again. His experience so far had left him paranoid and unable to rely on others. And because of that, he was approved to become Recovery One, and was placed into a secret unit within Freelancer called the Special Operations Unit Recovery, which is an entire unit within Freelancer who are tasked with responding to dead or dying Freelancer's recovery beacons. And once on scene, they are to recover them according to mission parameters. The exacts of their operation are done in secret, and those outside the mission specifics don't know the full details. This being either the AIs that are being recovered, the agents that the AIs are being recovered from, or even other recovery agents as well. And this position within Freelancer was the perfect cover for Wash, allowing him to play the role of a loyal dog while actively planning the downfall of the director and Freelancer as a whole. Though Wash wasn't the only one hunting down the other Freelancers, another threat unintentionally created by the director and a former friend of Wash called the Meta had begun its hunt. And in his first encounter with the Meadow, Washington was intentionally shot in the back by Agent South Dakota after she had synchronized with the Delta AI that he had lended her specifically so that they could compete with the Meta. The reason she did this was so that she could use Washington's body as bait so that she could escape with the AI, even cutting ties with Freelancer after doing so, likely out of a jealousy of never getting one while she was in the project and it was still active. But thanks to the healing unit that Wash had acquired previously, from the recovery of Agent York, he didn't die that day, surviving yet another brush with death and adding yet another name to his list of grudges. From here, Washington was given a new objective, to find and destroy the meta, and to do so he would need to enlist the helps of the Reds and Blues from the Blood Gulge outposts. And after reassembling most of the Red and Blue army, Washington would learn that the Epsilon AI wasn't destroyed after his failed implant, but instead it was placed into cold storage, and because of that, it could be used to topple the director and bring to light that everything that Project Freelancer has done, though its nature as an AI made it also a target of the meta. So with that in mind, Washington launched an attack on Freelancer Command under the pretenses of recovering the Alpha. Though once he got there, instead he revealed the containment unit for Epsilon, though the meta was soon behind them and began to attack the base, causing Washington to entrust Epsilon's safety to the Reds and Blues, along with trying to lure the meta deep within the facilities so that he could activate the base-wide EMP. Activating EMP. EMP? You have got to be fucking one that would destroy the meta along with all the AIs attached to it. Which, again, from his perspective, was a very risky move. As someone who wants to bring the director to justice, this could possibly destroy all the evidence of the director's actions. Thus is the reason that he wanted Epsilon to be as far away as possible from this pulse. Though, after successfully defeating the meta, Washington was detained, stripped of his title, and thrown into a UNSC maximum security prison for his raid against command. He was given, yet again, another new name, Prisoner 619B, which itself is a reference to the address of one of Rooster Teeth's old office buildings. And sitting within his cell, Washington would never learn if the Reds and Blues had escaped in time, or if the director would ever truly be brought to justice, or at the very least, he thought he wouldn't, until, spontaneously, he was connected to them, and informed that not only did they escape, but they still had the Epsilon in hand, which caused Washington to strike a deal with command that he would recover Epsilon in exchange for his freedom. This was a agreed upon, and Washington would be partnered up with the meta, now significantly weakened, his body stressed out by the amount of armor enhancements that he has to maintain on his own. 
And in a similar manner to how Recovery 1 established a different tone for the series going forward, Washington's role as an antagonist was really well handled, with his heel turn being hidden from the viewer until literally the last seconds of the season, with it even being cemented by him shooting a representation of innocence in the form of Donut. And this moment would become very important for Washington's character and is called back to multiple times throughout his development. He had essentially become everything he hated. And while he did end up betraying Freelancer, he also betrayed the Reds and Blues like every partner had betrayed him. Though eventually, Wash and the Meta would track down Epsilon, who had now become a Phantom of the Alpha, existing in a body similar to that of Church's. The way they found him is Tex caused their recovery beacon to activate. And while they used a modifying containment unit to restrain Tex, Washington was yet again betrayed by one of his partners. This being the Meta, who was tempted by the allure of AIs. He absorbed Texas Fragment and motioned to take Epsilon as well, though Wash stepped in to try to stop him, taking on some serious injuries, but thanks to the assistance of the Reds and Blues, and he not only survived this encounter, but he was also able to escape imprisonment. As after the dust settled, Epsilon chose to enter the containment unit that Tex was sealed in to try to save her, but it was sadly locked behind him, leaving behind not only all of his friends, but the Epsilon Church dead body that they were sent to recover. Cover, which the group then dressed up in Washington's armor and allowed Washington to dress up in his armor to allow him to stealthily escape undercover as the leader of Blue Team. Which I mentioned earlier is actually sort of a meta joke on how Washington has now literally assumed the role as the new leader of Blue Team and has become Church in a sense, so much so that he even ends up going by that name in both conversation and in official documents. Let me get this straight, Agent Washington. You took my name? Two, it's only in certain circumstances. Like when we talk to him, or need to fill out paperwork, or saying happy birthday to him. You gotta be fucking kidding me! This would continue the theme of Washington escaping death yet again. And it's here that Washington would seem to find a sort of happiness or peace within himself among the Reds and Blues. As unlike the UNSC, Freelancer, or Command, the Reds and Blues had no hidden agendas. They were pretty content and forward about their lives, not tempted by power or status. About, uh, well, outside of Sarge. In this new environment, Washington felt something that he hadn't in years. Peace of mind. All his burning hatred for the director had withered to nothing more than embers, and even after his old superior, Carolina, revealed that she was still alive and offered Washington the revenge he hungered for, he didn't seem all that committed to it. And when she proposed the idea of using the Reds and Blues, his friends, as distractions for her infiltrations, even threatening them with violence if they refused, this triggered a similar reaction in Washington that a certain staff sergeant felt back in his old UNSC days. Washington and raising his weapon at Carolina, as beyond feeling a sense of responsibility to protect the group of simulation troopers because he's the reason they're wanted fugitives now, he also found a real home among their group. And it's only after everyone agrees to help save Carolina that Washington goes along with them. And after successfully rescuing her from unwinnable odds and toppling the remnants of Freelancer, the UNSC issued the whole crew full pardons from their actions during the Freelancer saga. Though, on the ride back to Valhalla, their transportation ship crash-landed in a nearly forgotten planet named Chorus. And while on Chorus, Washington would find himself having to return partly to his old ways. Not only trying to lead both teams, but also eventually rebuilding his old suit of armor. Though this time, we do see that Washington is a truly changed man, and it's best demonstrated through the interactions with his rival during this trilogy, Locus. Locus is more or less a dark mirror to what kind of person Washington could have become if he never met the Reds and Blues, even having Locus appear in Washington's PTSD-riddled nightmares. Locus was this man damaged by war and the actions of his companions in a similar way Wash was due to Project Freelancer, but thanks to the goading on by Felix, the only person Locus trusted, he was never allowed a moment to heal, constantly being told to fulfill his orders because he's a soldier. This is actually a very similar relationship that Carolina and Wash had during Season 10, though with Carolina reappearing towards the middle of the Chorus trilogy, we get to see how both the characters have grown as well. 
And when Locus is given the opportunity to pick the thoughts of another perceived soldier like Wash, it was made very clear that Locus had lost track of his identity long ago. And throughout the trilogy, Wash's words would have a heavy effect on Locus. And alongside other things, it ultimately led to Locus's betrayal of Felix and an overall face turn for the mercenary, realizing that the most important part about being a soldier is not power, money, or fancy equipment, but being true to oneself and finding companions you can actually rely on. And after the Reds and Blues succeeded in their mission and helped save Chorus alongside bringing down Sharon Industries, they all decided to retire for at least a little bit. Finding an isolated moon around Chorus, they vanished from the public eye. But soon after their disappearance, another group of Blues and Reds would begin attacking UNSC facilities and ex-freelancers began going missing. This factor concerned Washington and Carolina, who dispatched themselves to see if they could track down the harder-to-find retired freelancers that they knew. But while at Agent Illinois' beach house, Carolina and Washington would use this time to connect on a deeper level. With Wash seeing a lot of his former self in Carolina, someone who's lost and doesn't know if they can really start over, spending a lot of their time focusing on the past. But Wash assures her that she's come a long way, and that the two of them, together, can work on becoming better people. Not by destroying their past, but by changing their present. Which is a mentality that actually stands opposed to the villains of this arc, that being Temple and the Blues and Reds, who believes that they should not only destroy in order to get a fresh start, but that they deserve to do so. And it's Temple's desire for revenge that led Washington and Carolina to be taken hostage and left to rot in their locked up armor in Temple's underwater base. Though, thanks to the help from an unlikely place, Locus returns to save Washington and Carolina. But the days of hunger and dehydration had left them unable to fight, and Washington extremely loopy. As soon as this elevator stops, I'll be ready to kick ass and take names. We're not in an elevator. Oh, well, in that case, it's gonna be up to you three to save the day. Three? Yeah. You, Locus, and Big Bird over there. What up, Big B? So much so, that in the middle of a firefight, started because of Tucker's own desire for revenge, Wash was completely unsure where he was, and eventually wandered out into the direct line of fire, catching a bullet to the neck. Unknown to anyone at the time, this injury would temporarily become the most important event in the entire universe. As, due to the nature of the neck wound, Washington's brain was starved of oxygen for minutes, leading to a condition known as cerebral hypoxia, which in turn caused Washington to suffer a noticeable brain damage that affected mostly his memory, leading Washington to have long-lasting headaches and short lapses of memories or events that he was taking part in. This is best represented in him telling the same story again and again that, from his perspective, he's telling for the first time. Though, Wash wasn't fully aware of how severe his injury had become, with Carolina not having the heart to tell him that he had brain damage, leaving him out of the loop and resulting in Wash wanting to continue to work once his wounds had fully healed up. Though, during the end of Season 16, Washington would find out about his brain damage and become enraged that something so important would be hidden from him by the people he trusted the most. Likely getting some flashbacks to the freelancer days of people keeping secrets from him. And did you all know? No. Did you? No. Was I the only one who didn't know I have fucking brain damage? Dude, we had no idea. I kept it from everyone, Wash. Including me! Yeah. Washington lashed out against his friends and left the group in silence, which compelled Carolina to make things right, as she suggests the group use the time travel guns. Alright, yes, there's actual time travel in Season 16 and 17, though the technology is presented more like it was designed in a similar vein to Forerunner technology, so I'm honestly fine with it. But anyways, Carolina suggests that they should save Washington before he is shot. And in doing so, the Reds and Blues break time, creating a paradox now where Wash exists in two simultaneous timelines, one where he was shot and one right before he was shot. Though this paradox didn't just affect Washington, instead it created a whole fracture in time that began to branch off into more and more alternate timelines. The whole timeline eventually became known as the Everwen, and soon, Donut would help Washington snap out of his paradox-like state and together, the two of them would work to correct the timeline 
and eventually get everyone else to wake up from being trapped within the Everwind. And for those who haven't actually seen season 16 and 17, I highly recommend it. Washington and Donut's chemistry is actually fantastic, but besides that, eventually the gang is able to correct time and overcome the paradox, but eventually get locked up in a location called the Labyrinth, where they are confronted with their greatest fears. For Washington, it takes the form of everything he has hated about himself, from the endless battles against an unknown force, right up to all his friends dying due to commands issued by him, which placed him in the role of the staff sergeant he despised his whole life. And finally, it's the ultimate punchline to him being the lone survivor yet again. As from his perspective, everyone died trying to correct his mistake, which nearly drove him into a suicidal final rush, until he was ultimately saved by Doc. Singularity gets a little weird. Eventually, the crew would all escape the labyrinth, with one paradox left to correct. This, of course, being Washington's injury. Wash obviously accepts what's to come, and everyone assures him that they would be there for him when he wakes up. And with the knowledge that he wouldn't be alone on the other side, Washington sacrifices everything. Not only his career as a soldier, but his outstanding memory that has been a key part of his character this entire time. He does so, all to assure the safety of the world. Though, in a way, Washington's injury was also a weight being lifted off him. He no longer was shackled to freelancers, AIs, or even the war. Due to this injury, he could peacefully retire. Now, well, until Red vs. Blue Zero decided to undo all of this character payoff and undo Washington's brain damage entirely so that they could make a microwave joke. But that's why we're not talking about Zero. Washington is without a doubt my favorite character in Red vs. Blue. He's actually honestly one of my favorite characters in general, being part of a series that I grew up watching as a kid. I found a lot of myself in his character, mostly in the workaholic tendencies, but the fate that he goes through is honestly one of my worst nightmares. And to veil off a bit, it really does help me come to terms with memory loss as a concept, because it's one of the most terrifying things to me specifically. And beyond just the solid reoccurring themes of his character, from his jokes, to his memory, to the betrayal, authority. At the end of the day, he's someone who just desired to see a better world than the one that created him. And when made to make a sacrifice that was forced into his hands by another, Washington did so without regrets. Because he's a hero. Someone who doesn't desire power, and doesn't need to see the end that they want to create with their own eyes. He's someone who has a little faith and those around him, that they'll see his mission through to the end. And ain't that a bitch. Now, if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it in the future, I have a Patreon at patreon.com slash guy. And uh, this is the segment where I would normally tell you to buy Shimonetta, but instead, I am going to say that you should go out of your way and purchase a copy of Volume 9 of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist manga, because it has Dungeon Dice Monsters in it, and Dungeon Dice Monsters is better than modern Yu-Gi-Oh!